Let us go ahead and get ourselves started with session nine of the CED 120C, 220C. Today we're actually going to like uh, shift the corner a little bit and move into using Dynamo in a very different way. We've been talking a lot about how we can use Dynamo and these kind of scripting languages to generate forms, uh, mathematical equations and things that allow us to kind of generate sort of different alternatives pretty quickly. We're going to shift our focus today to thinking about using it more as an evaluation tool. So using uh, it to go through and vary forms, but then pull parameter values out or pull values out that we can compute to somehow evaluate something about that form, whether it's its overall size or its volume or something about like how much sun is hitting it, but to really evaluate those sorts of things and then pull those members, start aggregating them into lists so that we can then um, either change the form in some way to respond to those numbers or use it as an overall evaluation as to whether we think the form is good or not. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of where we are going today. As we get going, just to remind you of where we were, we uh, last time looked a lot at assignment one, some of the things that people had done, some of the very cool things that people had done with their assignment one projects. And we started looking at, if we did go through and panelize the surface, how we could go through and use very simple little mathematical patterns to start imposing patterns upon the elements. You know, checkerboards, every other out of third, something like that. Uh, we also started getting into this whole issue of this notion of really understanding which direction things are facing uh, by using the concept of a dot product, where we continue to explore that quite a bit today. The whole notion of there being a surface normal, a vector which is perpendicular to your surface, um, projecting out, and then being able to compute dot products of it versus other vectors, you can start to tell an awful lot about what direction are you facing, or what sort of things are uh, hitting you based on that orientation. So that's where we're kind of going today. As we get going, though, there's a little bit of material specifically about just you know filtering and being able to control things based on values that we want to talk about. In particular, we want to talk about the concept of a Boolean filter. And it's actually going to come back in and help us a little bit relative to something we tried to do before. I said I owed you an outstanding answer to the whole notion of could we go through and control the regeneration of elements based on an if value, you know, if true or false. And you know, sort of found sort of where the problem is and a way to work around it by using this notion of a Boolean <laughs> filter. But let's just kind of talk about that. It's going to be example 9.1, but here's basically what we're going to do. As an overview for where we're heading over the next little bit, what we're going to do is we're going to build a filter, a filter that's going to be based on true or false values. Okay, and those true and false values are going to indicate whether or not we should regenerate the elements. Okay. That's going to kind of work out OK. If we say true, it's going to regenerate a list of elements. If it says false, it's not going to regenerate a list of elements. It turns out the if, just using the if for the true or false, didn't work out very well. And after a little experimentation, I found out what it really hates is the notion that one of the branches is an empty list. As soon as one of the things it encounters is empty, it all hell breaks loose. It doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing, and it gives the incorrect values. So what we're going to be doing is, rather than going through and doing it as a simple if, we're going to create a list of Boolean values, either true or false, and based upon those Boolean values, either do something or not. Okay? And that's going to actually be common to the first three examples today. So we're going to create something called a filter by Boolean mask. What it takes in is a list of elements that will be filtered, and a mask. And a mask is really a one-to-one -one list that corresponds to each of those elements where it has a value of true or false. And true um, included, false don't include it. And how we're actually going to use that is based upon our Boolean, we can either feed a whole bunch of trues or a whole bunch of falses to go through and either regenerate or not regenerate. So that's where we're going to start heading off. We're going to also do a little work in terms of creating a custom node. We sort of alluded to this. As soon as you start having blocks of code, which really almost operate as a subroutine with inputs and outputs that you'd like to repeat, custom nodes come in. And you've encountered some, like uh, quads from a rectangular list was one. You know, you can start figuring out that you can actually create all sorts of interesting ones for yourself. So, Let's go ahead over to Revit if you can, and we're going to start with just uh, example 9.1. Let me go on out there. 
Hopefully you can be able to download it. This one's just called, oh, controlling element regeneration. You'll see the Revit file is very boring. It's a bunch of desks. Okay. Desks are what I always use as a placeholder for a family instance. It's kind of in every file that's loaded as one of the defaults. But this would just as easily work for your adaptive components or something like that. So as a starting point, why don't you go ahead and just knock out those desks. Just uh, highlight them and get rid of them just so um, Dynamo will be understand that it's recreating and placing them in again. It's kind of an interesting thing about regenerating. If things are understood as coming from the Dynamo script <coughs> in that session, then, as you keep on changing the parameters, Dynamo will keep moving them around as necessary. If they came out of a prior session, somehow Dynamo doesn't understand that it owns those, so it keeps them around, and often that residue confuses you, because they're hanging around, but they don't seem to be doing uh, what you wanted them to. So, we're gonna go to our add-ins. Go to Dynamo. Glenn, yes? If you had, like, Revit Geometry, Dynamo Geometry, you wanted to start like in the next session, hmm? with fresh Dynamo geometry, how would you select all the if it's like sort of very This is actually a really kind of hard thing. It's about the only way to find one and say select all in Revit. There's no easy way. I really wish there were. That's one of those, and that's how we gotta keep on trying to play to figure out the way to do that. And I don't know a good way just to say go out and grab all the existing stuff and just, you know, wipe it out. That's Kind of an annoying limitation. There's probably all sorts of good reasons for it, but it just sort of inconveniences us in the meantime. Okay. Is there a way in Dynamo to add some kind of parameter or tag to the elements it produces? Oh, well, now that's actually kind of clever. We could do that, not automatically, but we could go ahead and basically, you know, set a parameter, which is like a flag to say that you were Dynamo created, and then we could actually have our own little Dynamo script that says, get all elements in any category, and if you have this flag set, grab you, and then we can delete you. So that's actually, that's a clever way to do it, to set our own flag, yeah. not an automatic one. Who did that? <laughs> <laughs> Said the man in the second row. Excellent. No, that's a, that's a clever way. A lot of times you're sort of trying to you know, figure out how to beat the system, and there's often ways to do it. Okay, so let's just kind of walk you through what's going on in here. This is sort of the example of regenerating, but I want to show you sort of where it breaks and how I think we can work around it. At the top of this script is really just a little bit of if then, just to uh, kind of illustrate how if then works or if works. So at the top we have a node, it's basically an if node. Test is basically being fed either true or false. Okay, so whatever we've chosen in that Boolean. And there's two simple lists. And you'd sort of expect that what would happen here is if true, you get the one, two, three. If false, you get the four, five, six. Okay, and it kind of does what you think it should there. So if I expose the values, there's four, five, six. If I flip over to true, it goes over to one, two, three, it's kind of doing what you think it ought to. Okay, and that's kind of good. Where it sort of breaks down, though, is if we use that same sort of logic and we feed it a list empty. When you feed it an empty list, which is what I used to do as a way to sort of stop it from regenerating things, it doesn't do what you would expect. And in the second part, failing if test, empty list on one branch, it sort of illustrates that. But let's kind of walk you through what it is doing. The idea here is I was going to go through and put some different points in. That on the floor at uh, the x value of 0, going all the way to 50, spacing them by 10. So it would be 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way going up to 50. Okay. That's going ahead and creating this chain of points that you're seeing along the uh, kind of red x-axis right now. So that part's pretty good. Sort of see there's my list of points kind of hanging around down there. They're looking pretty good. Okay. On the opposite side, though, if I didn't want to generate those points because I didn't want to go through and generate oh, my little desk family and place them in there, I put a list in there. And again, that's what used to work. If, uh, if true or false, either empty list or list of that, 
And then if it got empty list, it'd go over and the family would have an empty list of points. It wouldn't do anything. And it didn't really have any place to put the points. Okay. But this is the part that doesn't work anymore. So what happens is if you go true, for example, and you come over to if, you see you have empty list. If you say false, you have empty list. So that is not good at all in terms of what's happening. Okay. Yeah, just to kind of check the logic to sort of see why it's doing it or whether you were getting the logic right or something like that. What I tried doing was actually putting in an alternate branch. So this is going to go 0 to 50 just along the x-axis. This other branch is going to go 0 to 50 along x and y. So kind of create a little diagonal thread that's going out. So if you plug that in instead as the false branch, you actually get things. So either the true or the false. Or let's me it's easier to see back over here. You can grab all those. So it's just the empty list that's fine. Actually, in this case, what am I doing? I'm getting them both. Yeah, the empty list is the part that really sort of messes it up. What's going on here? There's my x's and my y's. That's false. Let's go back to true again. See, am I doing something? OK, that's true. <coughs> that's false. Although it's interesting, I'm still seeing the true ones there. You know, let me see what's going on there in terms of whether I'm regenerating them. I'm getting both. OK, if I'm on the false path, I should be coming over here. Let's see how many points I have there. I still just have six points. So theoretically, I have six elements there. Hmm. So I'm not understanding where these ones are coming from again. They keep on coming back. Because the purple block is regenerating them. Oh, down at the bottom. Well, I have to. No wonder I'm not looking down there. <laughs> uh, okay, let's take a look at what the, the purple block does. Maybe to uh, just sort of get rid of that, I'll just knock out that list there temporarily. Okay, that's better. Thank you. It's like, what's going on here? So uh, that's not going to look very good. Pull that over. Pull that in here. Maybe zoom in or out. Well, the dynamo is I always want like a second monitor. And that's something we don't get around here. Okay, so false is diagonal, true is that. Okay, that's looking the way it's wanted to. Super. So that kind of works, at least we can test that. The if doesn't inherently have the problem, it just has the problem on the uh, empty branch. Let me go ahead and I'm going to disconnect this side over here just so that we uh, no longer are creating those as we start playing around in the purple block. The purple block works like this, and it's really kind of a kind of cool little trick, but let's kind of follow it. The idea is we're going to use something called a Boolean mask. And a Boolean mask is really just for every list value, we're going to go through and compute some sort of true or false about whether or not we want things to be in there. So, we still are going to go through and create some chords, my coordinates. I'm going 0 to 50 by 10. That's kind of cool. Okay. What I want to do is generate a list of either true or false values okay, that correspond with those one on one. So what I can do down here is, okay, you can see I have uh, six elements right there. What I really want to do is get either six different trues or six different falses. It's kind of interesting. You sort of wish you could just take the true or false as a single one and you kind of pull it in and this list filtered by Boolean mask. 
but I actually need to go through and create a list of 60 of trues or falses. Here we're doing the same thing all the time, so we're controlling the generation of uh, the entire you know, kind of element that number of times. Um, we're going to start using this a little more creatively in the next example where in terms of generating trues or falses, we'll do it based on a value. Either you'll be true or false, and based on that, something will happen to you. But we'll grab the coordinates. I want to get a bunch of trues and falses. So what I do is I grab true. I say make a list of, and this is kind of a cool function, of repeated item. And then I just need to count how many to make. So I'm going to count so it always corresponds to the number of coordinates. So I'm going to come over here. My list count is going to say six. And the list of repeated items is six trues. OK. So if you have a list of six trues, and you have a list of points, what you do is bring them together in this. And for every one that is true, it'll go through and pass it through on in. If it's not true, it'll pass it through on out. So either you're in the set or out of the set. So if I pass that list in, you'll see I'll either get a bunch of ins or outs. So just to kind of check this out, you can try changing true to false. If I change it to false, then it's a whole bunch of falses. Then this list is evaluated against all those falses. So the inside is empty. The false side has six elements in it. Okay, so this Boolean masking is going to turn out to be a real kind of useful thing. Let me go ahead and I'll just copy that watch so that we have another one hanging around in here. Take it to the outside. So you can sort of see either things are on the inside or on the outside. Beautiful. Now, this unto itself is kind of useful enough in terms of controlling the sort of things are generated because if that list is either full or not, in our case, I'm going to take it from the inside. So to guarantee, uh, just get the list of that matched the criteria, whether you chose true or false. And we're just going to go through and take that to the family instance by point. Okay. So either it's an empty list, at which point nothing will be created back there, okay, or it's a true list, at which point all those different elements will be created at that point. So that's just kind of a quickie way of going through and generating, or kind of having that regeneration switch built in there. But let's talk about it for a second. So let's start with that. Does the list filter your booleans by mask? Does that sort of resonate with you in terms of a bunch of trues or falses? I mean, if you're true, you're going through. If you're false, you're not. Okay, excellent. Yes? Why, um, I'm not understanding the in and out. Um, like, why would you just Um, well, the question again, it's either if you were feeding an empty list, actually, what it's doing is it's saying, okay, point zero here and list value zero here. So true or false, either you're going to go <coughs> in or out. It's one or the other. Like it's in the list or out of the list. Or it's, it's sort of either you, met, either you, you had, if you had true match to you, you go into the in bucket. Mm -hmm. If you have false match to you, you go into the out bucket. So it's not just getting rid of the items that you, did, that you wanted to filter out. It's like keeping them separate. Oh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So in is you qualify, out is you didn't qualify, but it still keeps the non-qualifying okay. list. Cool. Okay. So very useful sometimes because often, you know, if I want to make some things green, I want to make the other things red. It's the, you sort of often have the flip side of what you're trying to do. So here's what I want to think about. This little function here, this little function which has this list filter boolean, list repeated items, and list count, it's actually kind of a funky little chunk of code there that you might want to reuse sometimes. Because if we really want to have a regenerate uh, items sort of switch, and we want to be able to kind of plug in a boolean, could you picture at some level what I would really like to do is this. Go ahead and grab, oops, hang up there, view. Mm. 
go flashing around. Okay, let's try this. Still working there? I think it is. What I'd really like to do is, I'd almost like to take a boundary and draw it right here. And say that little chunk of code is a subroutine. And it has a couple of different inputs. It has the notion of whether you want to do it or not. It has the list of points coming in. Okay. And on the tail end of that, what I want coming out is the list of points that actually qualified. I could have the list of points that didn't qualify. But it's really the whole notion of could you make that into a single node and make a chunk out of that? And that's a really useful thing that we can do. And it's called creating a custom node. And any time you start having little blocks of code where you want to do things very repeatedly and you want to use a whole lot of time, you can go through and just put it together into a block of code. So that's going to show you how that works. So let me start with the principles. That sort of makes sense in terms of why I would want to do that? Because then I could go through and use this same single node that has a true value, has a list, and the out list. And based on like a, you know, wherever I place that, I could always go through and do the filtering. And I kind of based on whether it's true or false. So here's how you actually create a custom node. It's actually fairly straightforward. What you do is when you want to create a custom node, you choose the nodes, if I can grab them, that you want to include. I'm going to include that list count. I'm going to include the list of repeated items and the list filter boolean by mask, or list by filter by boolean mask. Okay. Those three nodes, they have certain things that go into them and they have certain things that come out of them. Those are going to be the inputs and outputs of the node. And when I want to create this custom node, what I do is go under the edit menu and you say, let's create a node from the selection. It's going to sound really strange, but here's what it does. We give it a name. I'm going to call it element region by Boolean. So it's just a name that I'm going to use. There's nothing special about that name other than the fact that I need to be able to find it you know, later on. You tend to have a category that you want to assign this to. The category is where do you want it to show up over here in your list of uh, functions. Okay. Ultimately, you can kind of keep these as your own private functions or share them with the rest of the world. So if you want to start sharing things like Zach has build Z, if you want to have your own DOM series of nodes, you can create the DOM category and kind of send it on out there. So I'm just going to put it in the 120C category. Just that's where it'll sort. First time I just make that up. I'll say OK to this and watch what happens. OK, it got replaced. Now let's think about this magical node. OK, it's going to take a list. It's going to take some sort of item, the true or false. It's going to kind of pass something out. Now these names aren't quite right yet. We're going to go through and adjust those. But I have a single node that should hopefully do the same thing. And just if you want to test it to make sure, go ahead and watch the node. That's the true value. That's the false value. It seems like it's still doing what I want to do, even though it's a custom node. But let's go ahead and take a look at it and how we can actually make it a little bit more useful. Okay, so let me just pause there for a second. Does everyone have a custom node sitting on their screen? Okay, if you have a custom node, what you're going to do is choose that custom node and right click on it and you can say edit the custom node. And it pops up a second little graph. Now notice in Dynamo now you actually have two tabs. You have the main tab for the main graph and you have this little custom nodes graph. And in terms of this, you can sort of see the inputs and the outputs. You can almost see what it looks like. It looks like, oh, and you can sort of string these around however you want to. It looks like the list of items that I was going to go through and do the filtering on is right here. You can sort of see it has the name list and it has some sort of help for what it'll look like. That's part of the little help string that'll come in there. But what I'm going to do is actually 
Just change its name to be list of items. Just because I like to see that, that makes it a little bit easier for me. In terms of this one over here, this is the one that's always going to be the true or false. So this is going to be the Boolean value that I want to repeat the number of times. So I'm just going to call that O my Boolean value, true or false. Super. Now, those are the two inputs that this node this wants. This one over here is the output. So you can go ahead and say whatever you want to call it over there. You could say that it is the in this case list of true items. Actually, it's really it's not the true items. It's really the list of matching items. Because if I fed it false, it would be the list of false items, too. No, actually, I take that back. In this case, the way we've structured it, it's basically giving the list of items in there based on whether you chose true or false there. Now, these are always the true items. The ones that are on the outer are always the false items. So you can decide now whether you want to have a single output, only the list of true items. If you want to sort of have the list of false items, you can put that as an output too. You have your choice. But as an output, that shows up there. If I type in output over here and then put another output, Actually, the best thing would be to say list of items that match the flag. That could be out. But once you have your little node here, and very often you create the node and you don't really need to do much with it. I'm just sort of trying to clean up the names to make it a little bit easier to understand what's going on. Uh, you can go through and save it. I have a little star there. You'll see right now the title indicating I've done a little bit changing. But let's talk about where you save it. Because this is something you probably want to do. Come on in. Okay. When you go through and you first create your custom node, it goes ahead and it, it is so nice to you. It says, I know what you want to do. You want to put this node into the default library with all the other nodes. So I'll put it into that default library on this machine. Okay, which is great if you're always working on the same machine all the time. But if you sort of bounce around a lot like I do, what you may want to do is not save it here. You might want to save it in a folder where you'll be able to get to it very easily. Okay, so I'm going to change around a little bit. I'm going to say, let's do a save as on this. And say, you know, not out here in my app data roaming Dynamo 0.9 definitions, which is fine if I'm a computer. What I'm going to do is instead take it out to my folder. And the best thing to do is actually, if you're going to use this as part of a project, put it in the same folder where the project is. Because when you put it in the same folder as the project, every time you give someone that folder, all these little custom nodes will be included in the same folder. It'll be a lot easier for them to find things. So I'm going to say element regen by Boolean to save it out there. Notice it has a slightly different suffix to it. It's not BYN, it's actually BYF. Okay, so those are the little subroutines. Okay, but I've saved it away. You can close it or just go on back. Notice now over here, this actually has the names that we put in there. So in terms of what's happening here, uh, oh, it looks like I got two different apps there. That's a little messy. I just want a single thing. I'm going to go back and re-edit that so I don't have the empty list. So I only really want the first one. 
Okay, so do these values over here, or these names that are coming up here, those are just really right based on what you put in there as the labels in the input boxes. But what you're seeing there is just coming as the label you put in the output box. I'll go back over here and sort of see what I did. Because that shouldn't be. Come back over. I'm going to take that out for now. It should be its own separate thing. Oh. Did I do a cross product? Let's see what's going on here. I think it's kind of over. It's a single item. Should be able to take that out. Okay. Let's save that away. It'll pass on out. Okay. I'm gonna come back over here for a second and just sort of talk about at a high level what we did. We sort of built some little filter, just saying list filter by Boolean mask, and then we created a custom <laughs> node. What we did was we selected the nodes, which I always want to do is select the nodes that should be in the custom node. Um, leaving the things that are the interfaces hanging out because those will all be turned into either inputs or outputs. You can adjust the inputs or outputs. That's where you can add the names to it and just make it a little bit more uh, easy to follow. And then what I typically do is I'll save locally just because the app data is kind of a bad place to save things. Okay. So let's pause there and see if that kind of makes sense. Kind of resonating? Yes. Looking good there. Looking good. Yes. Okay, let us go back over and even try another example because it'll I'll put it right in here. We'll do another one. <coughs> so I'll still work with my little uh, six points here. I got a list of six points, okay, going from zero to 50. Okay. I'm going to put in another little node called list filter by Boolean mask. So list filter by Boolean mask. Okay. What it always wants is it wants your list and it wants a second list, a list of either trues or falses. So what it can do is I'm just going to create a code block that has another list in here. Let's try something here. If I said true, true in lowercase, true, 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 true. I need one more. True. <laughs> okay, so list of six trues. So now when I apply that mask, the in is all six points. We gotta pop that up. Okay, let's go ahead and what would I do to that list to knock out the second point? So point number index one. Okay, how could I knock that out? If I only wanted to have the first but not the second one. Yeah. If you put a false in as the second value, What's going to happen is it'll skip that point 10. So what happened was what used to be on the inside, that one value moved over to the outside. Okay, And that's really what we're going to do is just for these, just kind of come up with a list that does a one-to-one -one, one -to -one correspondence that either says you know, true or false. And the same way if I want to get rid of the last one, I'll go through and change it to false. I think one, two, three. Oh, I have one extra one in there, don't I? Okay. No one pointed that out. So the matches the indices of the different code blocks? It's the index. So index zero goes to index zero, index one goes to index one, two goes to two, three goes to three, four goes to four, five goes to five. Okay, so just one to one that way. So 
we are actually going to exploit this because we're going to go through and do something where we're going to create a little watcher. We're going to say, let's go out. We're going to get some boxes. We're going to sort of take a look at how much floor area is in those boxes. And we're going to compare that to a criteria. And either you're going to be less than or higher than some threshold. And based upon whether you're below or above the threshold, you're either in or out. Okay, so we'll go through. And as opposed to sort of wedging in a whole bunch of true false values manually, we'll set up a little if then or a little comparison statement sort of uh, do the comparison versus the threshold. And that's a very common way of setting up what I'll call a code checker. Or in this case, you're just checking some values and then using Dynamo to give you feedback about whether things are there or not. So we can do that, for example, oh, just sort of say, you know, how big certain rooms are. For example, we know that, oh, based on the size of the room and the number of occupants, you know, we may need to go ahead and put two doors in as opposed to one door. There's all these things that might change as rooms get bigger than certain sizes. So just going through and checking the size of different rooms is actually kind of a useful thing to see, you know, oh, okay, you know, you need two doors, do you have two doors? And if you do or don't, we can sort of flag that as a little bit of code checker to say that, hey, here's something where you might need to do something to kind of adjust so it matches code. And that's kind of a general kind of principle or a general like value that we can add to this. It's this whole notion of that we can build these different things that filter based on parameter values. So where we're adding or what we're adding to the equation isn't all that different. What we're going to do is say, let's get some elements. We're going to get them sort of, or we're going to grab some elements, and then we're going to get some value about the elements by name. So we're going to grab a parameter. And what we're going to grab for our example is actually going to be we have a bunch of box elements, and we're going to grab the floor area, something called the gross floor area. Then we'll filter that based on, so maybe either you're above a threshold or below a threshold. And then whether you are in the in or the outs, we'll either adjust your color to red or adjust your color to green. So just depending on where you are relative to that threshold. So that's the, the road map, for example, 9.2. If you come back over to Dynamo, we can actually like uh, take a look at that. So we'll just go ahead and open a Revit 9.2. Let's just take a look at this. So in 9.2, what you'll see is I just have some boxes hanging around out there. They're not all that interesting. They're just like little boxes that were created with the box mass form element. Okay, those boxes have heights, widths, depths. Those are all values we can get. So I could check any of those things. I could say, hey, if anything's width is greater than 50, go through and grab it. You know, what I decided to do for this little example is actually just grab this thing called the gross floor area. So each of these different boxes has its own gross floor area. Some of them are single story, some of them can be two story. So example, if you want to change it around a little bit, no worries, just grab, for example, that box, and I can add another mass floor to it. You'll see its gross floor area increases. It went from 900 to 15. Or if you change that a little bit, if I decide to make that, oh, 40 as opposed to 30, you'll see it changes a little bit, but also the gross floor area changes. Where's, so the, where's gross floor? It's just kind of when you choose it, it's over here. Gross floor area is one of the values. It's one of those computed values. So when we're grabbing values, we could go ahead and grab based on either uh, things that we've put in there, or we could do any of the values that are computed. A lot of things that are computed in the background we don't think about. So you know, if we want to do surface area or volume, any of those values, we can go through and grab them. And the scenario, again, is that you could be designing, and you're rearranging your boxes and trying to make a form that sort of feels right. And then at some point, you just want feedback. Did you cross over a threshold that you know, makes a difference? Okay, so got the scenario, what we're up to? Okay, you have boxes. Okay, if you got boxes, let's go ahead and talk about how we can grab them. Now, these boxes, in terms of grabbing, and there's a couple of different things we could do. We could go ahead and sort of grab all the elements that have the name box. Okay. Or you could just say, I want to grab all the elements that are of type mass. 
Making all the elements of type mass is kind of interesting because then you could also uh, build, uh, get cylinders and spheres and anything else that happens to be a mass type too. In fact, even just sort of to uh, complicate this a little bit on my side, I'll just go through an insert, load a family in there. I'm going to grab the masses. I'll just grab the uh, cylinder. Let's put it out here. Morning. That's always alarming, isn't it? <laughs> and then I'll put a mass floor on it. Okay, so even it over here has some sort of, what does it have there? It has some sort of gross floor area, about 700 square feet right now. Based on, we can change it so, I think 25, get a little bigger. So I got masses hanging around out here. And now I want to go through and uh, just kind of grab them and get those gross floor area values. So again, what I'm going to do is grab all these masses, and then I'm going to go through and say, hey, get the element parameter by name, um, gross floor area. Yes? Oh, I want to load family. And just go to the masses and grab yourself another one out there. So load. Uh, what else? Get, get the uh, pyramid, the torus. You like donuts? Okay, but what I had to do is I chose it and added a mass, a floor area, because the mass has a volume, but it doesn't have a floor area unless you make a mass floor. Okay. So I got those values. Let's go ahead and open up Dynamo, and we'll start by just getting all those values and tying them all together or getting all those masses and tying them together. So we'll say add-ins. Go on out to, oh, where's my dynamo? It must be open somewhere in the background. Are you here? There you are. Let me close this one. Actually, I don't need, well, no, I should close it. I'm on the cautious side about this. Because Dynamo scripts are understood as sort of running within different projects. So it's always a little bit safer to uh, open and close. So how about I'm going to go to 9.2. Just go ahead and grab 1A. Okay. So we'll store it over here in the corner. It's all going to start with just grabbing all the elements of, in this case, a category. So I'm going to grab everything that has mass. It's kind of a really useful function. This is one if you want to grab, for example, all the walls or all the uh, beams or all anything that's a Revit category. You can grab all those things that are in the same category. It's a bunch of different categories. These are all the built-in categories. Okay. So if you wanted to grab, I'm going to grab mass. That'll grab all the masses. You'd like to think, so that's just returning mass. There's a whole bunch of elements that I'm grabbing a bunch of elements. Those elements are going to be like all those elements that are mass elements that are hanging around out there. So once I have those elements, what I want to do is just grab all the parameters called gross floor area. Again, I could have got gross volume or something else. And the value that I'm getting is just based on these pieces of text over here on the side. So again, I could be getting, oh, like the uh, boxes will have width or depth. They also have height, but the cylinder wouldn't have height. Uh, the cylinder probably has height and radius. The gross floor area is something they all have. The gross volume is something they all have. So go ahead and connect those elements to the get the parameter by value and you should get a whole bunch of different values. That's actually not too bad in the scheme of things for grabbing elements like that. 
we could go through and put those out to an Excel spreadsheet if I wanted to kind of somehow add them all up or average them or something like that. I could do it internally here too. But we can start grabbing things, which is pretty good, especially if you had a thousand of some element hanging around in a project. It's kind of cool to kind of pull them out. Okay, so I pause there for a second. Are people looking at a list of values? Excellent. Okay, so the next part is we're going to create a list of just trues or falses based on these values. And the way I sort of set it up here was, and you can do some number of different ways. I just set up a little equation that said parameter value versus a threshold value in a code block. Okay, that's always going to return true or false. So what I wanted to do just to try this was I was going to take those parameter values. I'm going to use my little threshold value, which I set up as a slider, but you can do that as a number if you want. And this is going to return a bunch of trues or falses. So currently, my threshold is set up at zero, so all those things are greater than zero. That's kind of OK. If you want to try dragging that slider up, you'll see the list starts to change. At 500, everything's still bigger. Right around 900, things start to change. Okay, Now, all of a sudden, I have some trues and I have some falses. And again, all I'm really doing is comparing those versus the threshold. So first one, or zero if one is good, second one is false, the first index is false, the second index is true, the third index is false. And yeah, that's what we want. We want just a list of trues or falses because that's going to be our mask. Okay, excellent. So far, so good? Okay. If you have a bunch of trues or falses and you have a list of elements, we can filter those elements. So what we can do in the little blue box here is feed in the list of elements and then feed in the list of masks, the true or false masks, and then things are either going to sort into the in pile or the out pile. So it's, it's the sorting hat. So I'll take the mask values. For the list of elements, that's actually the things that will be sorted. Mm -hmm. So it's this list of elements right here. Did I actually you get also it? Oh, we could. Then it would return a, the values. In my case, I actually want the original elements. I'm going to colorize them, but no. Okay. Actually, that's a very good point. Let's just try it. Can you sort of see what the difference is? It kind of depends. It's, the answer is, it kind of depends what you're going to do with the tail end. So if I grab the values, or if I grab the elements, let's start with that one. You see I have a list of boxes and a cylinder that are in and two boxes that are out. And then I can override those elements. If I go by the values, because I want to get those list of values instead, so I have the above values, the below values, and I can compute now an average for the ones above, an average for the ones below. Something like that's numeric. Either one. So it's a very good question. Okay. So I've got these two different categories. I have masses that are in, I have masses that are out based on my threshold. Again, try sliding this threshold along and you'll sort of see that you're changing kind of what's in and what's out. You know, this could be something as simple as gross floor area. You could be changing, oh, the floor area ratio, ratio that's allowable. You could change all these different things and you want to sort of know whether things are qualifying or not qualifying. Okay, let's go ahead and give ourselves a little bit of visual feedback now. Because right now, just you know, having the two lists is kind of okay. You know, I can remove all the ones that are too small. I can do all sorts of things. But I really kind of one, one that I like to do is to do a little element override color in view, or co element color override view, or override color in view. Um, and based on, you know, sort of things that are in or out, oh, I'll make, like, for example, the ones that are in red or green, the ones that are out red, or vice versa. You know, I can sort of really, whatever color scoding scheme I want to use. Okay, so I could change their colors. 
I could also change their values. I could say that, you know, hey, somehow these ones that are bigger than the threshold, maybe I'll lower their height or lower their width or something to kind of change the, the properties. But whatever it is that I might want to do. But for right now, I'll just give a little color feedback. So that function is the ever popular element override color in view. I'm going to actually create two of these because I'm going to want to do it for the uh, ins and the outs. So I'm going to take all those in elements. I'm going to take all those out elements. Okay. Now I'm going to give them some colors. So now color, oh, we sort of played around this a little bit with a photo example, but ARGB is the color by ARGB is usually the one I use. And what that's looking for is just different values of R, G, and B. So pure red is like 255 as the red value and zero is the others. So I'll say 255 as the red value. Okay. If I want those other ones to be green though instead, what I can do is grab that same color by RGB. It's the alpha, which is kind of almost like, it's kind of like a transparency. <laughs> and I'll put the 255 on the greens down there. So now, this one's red, and that one's green, and I can drag those through. Miss Dom, are you stretching or asking? Asking. What you got? Why can't I just take, like, the same color by ARGB and, like, just make it grab that and put it down? Um, here? Yeah. yeah. Then they would both have the same color. Oh. So, so if I put two cooler blocks with two different colors, what happened? Like, would I get a mix or something? Oh, that's kind of very interesting in terms of doing that. Yeah. It's almost like we have to have two different lists. OK, I like where you're going. Is this kind of good? I think that the key is, it's it's because they have to sort of map there. I'm not sure I can do it. I sort of like where you're going. No, actually, okay. Like now I. Oh, <laughs> so you you got me. Uh, is that what you mean? Yeah, like change the color. Like you add so cool. Yeah. I I think it'd be almost like Dom. We'd do this. We'd say two fifty six zero. Nah, because it's a list there. It's it's an interesting one to kind of think about how to do it. I see that one off. Because I like the idea of the list, but I have to pull different values in the list for different ones. I'm just not sure about that. Good question, though. OK, so this should be overriding some in red and some in green. Let's check it out. I got some big ones. I got some small ones. That's not looking too awfully bad. OK, now the acid test is if you go through and start adjusting this, are they starting to change the colors? <laughs> so they're all red. There's some green. They're all green. Actually, at 2,000, no. There's that, that, that one over there, well, it's, it's greater than 2, 000, oh, 1,900. I see. It's a little bit bigger. So I still have two that are false. Oh, I got one at 2,000. I still got one that's false. Which, or one is true, it's the zero over there. So, for whatever reason, I guess it's, it's two stories right now, it's a big space. But in theory now, what should happen is whether I change that slider or even if I come over here and I change the values in Revit, my little design advisor is keeping an eye over my shoulder and always sort of giving me some feedback about whether I'm in or out. So that's just, you know, kind of a nice little idea of having these design advisors that are sort of uh, just kind of snooping in the background <laughs> and giving you a little feedback. Okay, it doesn't have to beat you over the head with a dialogue box, but just sort of uh, knowing that, oh, some things are red, some things are yellow, some things are green. You sort of get a sense that even though things are in various states of completeness, that, you know, that is to focus you on the things that need your attention. Beautiful.
Okay, let us pause here. We can answer any questions about all this. But this is the general principle of the whole design advisory. We want to go through and uh, trying to evaluate some things. We're going to go ahead and think about how we can apply that relative to the sun. But I just want to get that example out there. It's kind of a neat thing about filtering by Booleans and like uh, having that watch in the background for you.